When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Jesus turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumour spread amongst the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would have been written. What's the most important thing that has ever happened in the history of the world? What's the most important thing that will happen in the future? What's the most important thing that we can be doing in the present? Well, if you believe the news headlines over the past five months, the most important thing that's happened is coronavirus, uh, the rise of it and the spread of it. The most important thing that will happen in the future is the discovery and the administration of a vaccine. And in the light of that, the most important thing that we're told we can be doing as we wait uh, to get a vaccine is to follow government guidance and stay safe and maintain the restrictions. Watch your diet, wear a mask, stay two meters apart. And this, we're told, is a matter of life and death. That's been the news headlines. It's been the most important thing, according to the news outlets. And while these things are certainly important, they are not the most important thing. The news never, ever, ever gives screen time to the most important thing in the whole wide world, the most important thing ever. What is the most important thing? Well, our Bible passage this morning tells us, John 21 tells us. Uh, we've just read that conversation Jesus has with Peter after breakfast, that breakfast of barbecued fish that Jesus had miraculously provided for them and then cooked for them and then fed to them. The staggering thing about this is that the man eating breakfast, the man sat there on the beach chatting with his friends, is the very same man who just a few days earlier had been killed on a cross and buried in a tomb. They'd seen that happen and now here he is speaking to them. It's the most important thing that has ever, ever happened. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's big news. It's huge news. There is a man who has beaten the great enemy of humanity, your enemy, my enemy. He has beaten death. He died. And then on the third day after his death, he rose and he appeared to people on many different occasions to prove it. And we have one such occasion here in John chapter 21. That is the most important thing that ever happened. Jesus rose. And what about the most important thing that will happen in the future? Well, that is that this very same Jesus who rose from the dead and who has gone back to the Father will come back one day. He will return 
And Jesus refers to his return in his response to Peter's question about the Apostle John in verse 22. Jesus has told Peter that he will follow him to death. Peter wants to know what's going to happen to John. And Jesus says, what does it matter to you? What if uh, I intend to keep him alive until I return? Jesus is returning. He is coming back. And that's the end point of God's great plan for the world. Jesus is going to return. And that's the moment when this old broken world full of sinful people will end. And that's the time when God's new perfect creation full of renewed rescue people will begin. And the question is, will we be there to enjoy that? Not everyone's going to be there. Only Jesus' people will be there. And therefore, in the light of that future, that certain future, the most important activity in the here and now is eating the right food and distributing the right food. Eating the right food will ensure that you have a place in Jesus' perfect world. And distributing the right food will help other people to get there. And that's what Jesus' words to Peter in verses 15 to 17 of our passage are all about. Three times Jesus basically says the same things when he commissions Peter. Three times he says it. Verse 15, feed my lambs. Verse 16, take care of my sheep. And then verse 17, feed my sheep. Jesus' priority between his resurrection and his return is the feeding of his sheep. And that's who we are in this story. We are the sheep. We are needy sheep. We are hungry sheep. And therefore, we should be very, very concerned with what's happening here because our lives depend on it. We are sheep with no food. And without food, we're certain to die. And we are being told where to find the food that will save us, where we'll find the the food that's going to give us life. So what is the food that we sheep so desperately need? Well, in John's Gospel, Jesus has already spoken about sheep. Uh, Back in John chapter 10, he describes himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. So his sheep are his people. Uh, the people that he dies to save. In that very same chapter, he goes on to say this, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. Jesus' people, his sheep, receive eternal life by listening to his voice. Jesus gives life by speaking words of life. So the, the food that we so desperately need is Jesus' word. That begs another question is, where do we hear that word? Where do we hear Jesus' voice? And the answer that the Bible gives, the answer that John's gospel gives, is that we hear that word in the words of Jesus' apostles, the words of Peter and John and the others who were with Jesus from the beginning and saw everything that he did and heard everything that he said those who were witnesses of his resurrection from the dead, those, that small group of official spokesmen that Jesus commissioned to be his representatives in the world. That's the job that Jesus is entrusting to them as he commissions Peter to feed his sheep. The apostles are his official spokesmen uh, in the world, the official providers of his food. The words of eternal life that they have heard from him, they will proclaim and they will record in the Bible so that the whole world can hear Jesus' words and live. And uh, Jesus has been preparing them for for this job from uh, almost the beginning, from when he called them. And he particularly reminds them of it on the night before he died. On the night before he died, Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit, his spirit, to teach them and to remind them of everything that he had spoken to them. John 14, verse 26, Jesus says, The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. It's a promise to send the Holy Spirit. And then after his death and resurrection, he appears to them uh, to commission them to do the speaking work uh, in the world, to do his speaking work in the world. And this is what we see in John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. Jesus appears and he says, peace be with you. 
as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So he's sending them on a mission. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So Jesus is sending them on a mission, a mission that will begin when they receive the Holy Spirit in a few weeks time. That's referring to the day of Pentecost. This is a little preview of that day when he will send the Spirit to them. And from that day, they will be his witnesses in the world, proclaiming Jesus' words to the world. And Jesus' words to the world, his message to the world is a wonderful message. Do you see what it is from these words here in John 20? It's the forgiveness of sins. Everyone who believes the message is forgiven. Those who reject the message are not forgiven. The Bible tells us that our sin, our refusal to love God with our whole heart, and our decision to love ourselves more has put us under a death sentence. Physical death, which is a symptom of a much deeper and much more serious death, that's spiritual death, that's being cut off from God, not being able to know him not being able to relate to him. And unless our sins are forgiven, unless our sins are taken away, then we face the just and right sentence for our sin. And that is eternal death, eternal punishment, cut off from God for all eternity. That's the danger we're in. And the Bible tells us that we all have the sin disease. The good news of Christianity is that we can be forgiven. The good news is that a death has already taken place that takes away sins. And that death is Jesus' death. Jesus died for us. He died in our place. He died to take our punishment, the punishment we deserve. And so life comes to us through Jesus' death. And the apostle's job is to declare this life-giving gospel of forgiveness to a needy world. Or in the words of chapter 21 and our passage, their job is to feed Jesus' sheep. Jesus is saying, as he commissions Peter and the others, he's saying, go and give my sheep the life-giving food. Go and give them my word, my words of life. So Jesus' life-giving speaking work and his life-giving feeding work are one and the same. Jesus is also is entrusting his work into the hands of these men. Now, we know from what we've seen in the gospel that these men are the men who failed him, they're the men who deserted him, who denied him. And so we might question the, the wisdom of Jesus' strategy of entrusting his uh, mission to the world with these men. But the mission will succeed. It will not fail. The gospel will go to the whole world. And people from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation will be saved. It will happen. Their work will succeed. And it'll succeed because it's not really their work at all but it's Jesus' work. And that's what he teaches them and teaches us in the miracle that he's just done. We looked at it last week, just to remind ourselves what happened. They'd been out fishing all night. They caught absolutely nothing, no fish, and therefore no food, no breakfast. But then a word from Jesus, and their nets are absolutely full of fish, 153 big fish. So they go from no food to loads of food. It is a great feeding miracle. And it's got nothing to do with them and everything to do with Jesus. It's not their doing, it's Jesus' doing. And so it is with the greatest feeding work of all, the feeding of Jesus' sheep. The success of the work does not depend on them, on their abilities, their strengths, their skills. It depends on Jesus. It depends on the miraculous power of Jesus' voice to bring something out of nothing, to bring life out of death. And that is why it will be a success. That's why it was a success. Here's some striking statistics from 40 AD, that's about the time of uh, Jesus' resurrection just after, to 350 AD, Christianity grew within the Roman Empire by 40% each decade. And this happened despite opposition, despite persecution from the authorities. They tried their very, very best to crush the church, but they failed. And by 
around 307 AD, that's the time of the Emperor Constantine, around 33 million people, 33 million people had become Christians. That's 56% of the Roman Empire. Astonishing growth. And the reason is because Jesus' word is powerful. Jesus' word cannot fail. His mission will succeed. And that's why Jesus' mission over the centuries has continued to be a success and is a success today. That's why millions of people are becoming Christians all over the world. And that's why it will always be a success. It will never, ever fail. Just as Jesus' voice filled those nets with fish, so his voice will fill his new creation with people, with his sheep. So where do we get the life-giving food that we so desperately need? John chapter 21 is telling us where we get the food. This is a, a chapter telling us what Peter and the other apostles are. They are Jesus' authorized spokesmen. They are preachers of a message, and this message is how forgiveness comes to the world. Peter is the leader of a preaching team and a writing team. That's why John uh, includes the verses about himself. That's why he says in verse 24 as well that this is the disciple, that's himself, who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. He's telling us that his book, his gospel, John's gospel, what we're reading this morning, is an example of the food. You want the food that gives life, then you need to accept his message. You need to accept the message of the apostles, the message that we have written in the New Testament. The food isn't found anywhere else. It's not found in any other religion, any other philosophy. It's not found in atheism or materialism or hedonism, the pleasures of this life. It's only found in Jesus. It's only found in the apostles' message about Jesus. It's a message that if you believe it, will rescue you from eternal death, rescue you from eternal punishment and bring you into the life of God's new world. It will secure you a place in Jesus' new perfect world. So what's the most important thing that you can do today? Well, if you're not yet a Christian, I hope you can see that the most important thing that you can do is become a Christian. How do you do that? Very simple. Believe the message. Believe the apostles' witness to Jesus. Receive the food. Accept. Trust their words because their words are Jesus' words, Jesus' life-giving words to the world. And if you believe the message, trust the message, Jesus will give you life, and he will never, ever let you go. He will never take it away. You will become one of his sheep. And in John 10, we're told that Jesus gives eternal life to his sheep, and no one can snatch them from his hand. They are absolutely secure, and that will be you if you believe the message. That's the priority for you today, if you're not a Christian. If you are a Christian, the priority is to keep believing the message, is to keep feeding on Jesus' life-giving words in the Bible. And not just that, it's we make it our priority to serve others by helping them feed on Jesus' words as well. Our priority is to serve both Christians and non-Christians in this. We all desperately need Jesus' life-giving words as we have them in the Bible. Now, there's hundreds of ways that we can help others to hear and feed on Jesus' words. Each of us has a role to play in passing the message on. But if Jesus' priority is the feeding of his sheep, then it should be our priority too. And we should be using the different gifts that he's given us as we live and work in the different places that he's put us, just to ensure that the gospel word, this word of the apostles goes out and we need to make sure that it goes out intact as it is as it's been written we don't add to it we don't take away from it if we do that then we rob the word of its power these are the words these are jesus words and if we add or we subtract from them we take away the power and then as the message goes out we we trust jesus to be bringing people in that's his work it's the work he's promised to do he will bring people into his family, into his church. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't think of a better cause to devote my life to, a cause that is guaranteed success, a cause that can never, 
ever fail. Yes, some people will reject the message, but everyone who is meant to be in that new creation will be there. And that's an incentive for us to work hard at getting the message out. And I can't think of a better message to pass on. The life-saving truth about Jesus. I can't think of a better person to speak about. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Word who made the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Saviour of the world, the Bread of Life who gives his life for the life of the world, the Light of the world, and much, much more. And that's the note on which John ends. If you have a look at verse 25, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would have not room for the books that would be written. He finishes with his focus on Jesus, not on himself, not on John, not on Peter, not on any of the other apostles, not on the sheep, on Jesus. It's a poetic way of highlighting the unfathomable greatness and glory of Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of, uh, and God who is out of this world and yet who entered the world and suffered to save it. It's mind blowing. And that is a love that is out of this world. And the words that John finishes with, that the world can contain the books about Jesus, reminds me of an old gospel song, which is called The Love of God. And this is some of the words from it. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the skull contain the whole that stretched from sky to sky. I don't know if you noticed, but John keeps referring to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. And that's not a, a pride thing. It's a humility thing. It's an awe and wonder thing. John has understood the message that he preaches. It's a message about love, Jesus' love. He is the one Jesus loves. And he is absolutely astonished that the Lord of the universe, the Lord who is out of this world, would love someone as small and sinful as he is. And the same goes for us all. We're all the ones that Jesus loves. Now, there's nothing that we want more in the whole world than to be loved. And what John's gospel has been telling us is that we are loved. We are loved by the Lord of the universe, the most important person in the universe. And he loves us. He loves you. And the message is don't reject his love. Don't ignore his love. Don't walk away from his love. Don't be indifferent to his love. Instead, receive his love. Rejoice in his love and let his love compel you to follow him and serve him and to do that because you love him. Let's turn to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you that we live in a world beautifully created by you for the diversity of landscapes, animals and plants, we acknowledge that you have wonderfully designed our world in a complex and beautiful way, each part depending on and interacting with each other and sustained by you. Yet as we marvel at your tremendous creation, we are also saddened and often appalled at the suffering, misery and sin that inevitably pervades it. We pray especially this morning for the world as it struggles under the burden of the coronavirus pandemic. We pray especially for areas where this infection is a causing emergencies in already troubled areas, such as war-torn war Yemen and flooded Bangladesh. We pray for support for aid workers and medical staff in such countries, that they will be able to educate communities in an effort to halt the spread of the virus that people would have access to basic hygiene essentials and that hospitals would be able to function despite shortages of staff, protective equipment and basic medical supplies. We pray that work on a vaccine would continue swiftly 
and successfully. And we also pray that your light would shine into these devastated areas, that Christians would be able to carry your message of hope and salvation to a needy world. Amen. We pray specifically for our country. We are concerned about our economic future, about the resurgence of the coronavirus and about uncertain employment. Many of us know people who have been made redundant or are on furlough, but are worried about the future of their jobs. We pray for them that you would be their anchor in an uncertain world. We also pray for those who are still shielding against the virus and those whose everyday lives have been drastically changed by the pandemic. We ask for strength and hope for those undergoing these trials. We ask for wisdom for the government, medical staff and businesses as they plan the way forward through this crisis. Amen. We pray for churches known to us in the Morecambe Bay Fellowship. We pray that they would be able to continue to spread your word and minister to their congregations and communities despite the restrictions placed on them at this present time. We pray for the leaders in each church, that you would give each one wisdom and strength in the midst of these difficulties. We especially pray that Peter and Colin would be refreshed by their recent holidays and will have renewed vision for Trinity Church. We ask that all our churches will be able to sensibly and efficiently work out the best way to move forward as they plan the best way to meet as congregations in the coming months. We also pray for us as individuals that each of us would have an increased desire for you and for your word that as we face uncertainty and our foundations are shaken that we would turn to you as our rock and our hiding place. Amen. <laughs> 